Number one tells us the height of a diver above water is given by this function where T is the time measured in seconds and H of T is measured in meters. Select all statements that are true about this situation. So A says that the, the diver begins five meters above the water and B says that the diver starts three meters above the water. So only one of these can be true. And it's this constant number here that doesn't have a variable that is our initial height. And that would be because we would plug zero in for time. So our initial time is zero and anything times zero would be zero. So that initial height is going to be three meters, not five. Then part C says the function has one zero that makes sense. Um, and part C says that it has two zeros. So again, only one of these can be true. And so when we think about these, it's talking about the diver, the height of a diver above water. Okay, so then they're going to dive. Well, here's the water, right? So this would be the water. And then the diver is going to start here at three meters, and then they're going to jump and dive into the water, right? And so there's there are two zeros to this function because it's going to go this way, but the diver is not going to go backwards in time. Remember, this is your time. So this is zero seconds. This would be negative one seconds, and that doesn't make sense. So there's only going to be one zero that makes sense, not two. Then it says in E, the graph represents the graph that represents H starts at the origin and curves upward. Well, the origin is zero. That would mean an initial height is zero, first of all, which is not going to happen. And then the negative flips this function over. So this function is going downward, not upward. So there's multiple things wrong with this. Definitely not at the origin and definitely not going upward. Then F says the, the diver begins at the same height as the water level, which is not true. Okay, this one shows that the diver is starting three meters above the water. So they're on some type of platform, a diving board or something, right? A, a diving board, a dock, a bridge, whatever. And then they're jumping off of that. So they are not on the ground. So this one is not true either. Number two, the height of a baseball in feet is modeled by the function given here, and that graph is also shown to us. About when does the ball reach its max height? So we can see this max height here. You know, it's about right here, right? So we can see the max height, and then we can see when it happens. So the max height is happening um, about, I don't know, 1.8 seconds, right? 1.9, so something right before two seconds. So about 1.9 seconds. And then what is that max height? And so that's the vertical amount and that's about 60 and we're measuring in feet, so 60 feet. And then it says, when does the ball hit the ground? So then here's the ball's path. It's traveling above the ground, above the ground, coming back down, 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 down until it hits the ground. And so that looks like maybe 3.8 seconds. Number three, two rocks are launched straight up in the air. The height of rock A is given by the function F. The height of rock B is given by the function G. In both functions, T is measured in seconds and height is measured in feet. Use graphing technology to graph both equations and determine which rock hits the ground first and explain how you know. Um, so you can do this on Desmos or a graphing calculator or something else. So I used Desmos. And so rock A is in red, so this F function is in red, and then rock B is the G function in blue. So which one hits the ground first? And that's gonna be the blue function, okay? Because it hits before 
um, one and a half seconds, and the red function hits at about two fun two seconds. Um, so G was rock B, and that's because um, it hits the ground at about 1.4 seconds, maybe. Um, well, actually more than that, because this is 1.1234, 1 so like 1.45 seconds. And A hits at two seconds. So that's one way you could say it. You could say, you know, because the zero of graph G is further, is closer, you know, is further to the left. Number four, each expression represents an object's distance from the ground in meters as a function of time. Which object was launched at, a, at the greatest vertical speed? So the vertical speed comes in front of the T value. And so this one would be object B because it's at 50. Then the next one says, which object was launched from the greatest height? So your height, your initial height is this constant number at the end. And so that would be object A at 50 um, feet above the ground. Are they measuring in feet? Oh, 50 meters above the ground. Number five, Tyler is building a pen for his rabbit on the side of his garage. He needs to fence in three sides and wants to use 24 feet of fencing. The table shows some possible lengths and widths complete each area. So it's a rectangle, so we're just going to multiply these, right? So length times width for the area. So eight times eight is 64. Ten times seven is 70. Twelve times six is 72. 14 times 5 is 70, and 16 times 4 is 64. Which length and width combination should Tyler use or choose so that his rabbit has the most room, meaning the biggest area? So which one wears the biggest area? That's 72. So he should use the 12 foot by 6 foot combination. Number six, here is a pattern of dots. Um, and actually on this one, there's an error, okay? So if you look at this, it says step zero, one, two, three, where in the diagram, it says step one, two, three, four. So they made a mistake in the book. This should be step zero, one, two, and three. So you can fix that in your, in your book. Um, so then they want us to complete the table. So how many dots are in each stage? So we've got three in step zero. We've got four in step one. We have seven in step two. And we have, um, let's see, nine, 10, 11, 12 in step three. So then it wants us to figure out how many dots would there be in step 10. So now you wanna try and find a pattern. So as you look at this, one thing that I see that's in every one of these diagrams, right? So as I kind of look at three, two, one, zero, you see these three dots here in every single diagram, right? So we kind of see these in every single diagram. So then we want to try and figure out what's going on with these other dots, right? And so if we, maybe now you're seeing this three by three, I see the step number, I've got three by three, right? So this is getting me a square that's the same size as the step. So it's a three by three. This one is a two by two. This one is a one by one. And this one is a zero by zero. So we really, in step zero, have zero squared plus three. In step one, we have one squared plus three more dots. In step two, we have two squared plus three more dots. In step three, we have three squared plus three more dots. 
So in step 10, we should have 10 squared plus those three extra dots, which if you multiply 10 squared, that's 100 plus three would be 103 dots in step 10. And then thinking about it that way gives us our pattern, right? So we're gonna have in step N, we should have an N squared, okay? So N squared plus it should have those three extra dots. So N squared plus three there. Number seven, the function f is defined by f of x equals two to the x, and the function g is defined by g of x equals x squared plus 16. Find the values of f and g when x is four, five, and six. So if we plug in um, for f, two to the fourth is 16. Two to the fifth is 32. Whoops, probably put those kind of close. Okay, so 16 for the first one, 32 when we plug in five, and then two to the sixth is um, 64. So then when we plug in for G, we have four squared, which is 16. So if we do four squared, it's 16 plus 16 is 32. 5 squared is 25 plus 16 is 41. And then 6 squared is 36 plus 16 is 52. Will the values of F always be greater than the values of G and explain how you know? So will the values of F always be greater than G? Um, and so when we look at this, like they're not greater, it's only greater here, right? So there's two options down here where they aren't greater. So F is not greater than, than G here. So when X equals four and five, um, F was less. So now moving forward, it's always going to be bigger, right? So as we keep going, F will stay bigger than G, but there's a couple, there's values below that where it's less than it. Number eight, Han accidentally drops his water bottle from a balcony of his apartment building. The equation D equals 32 minus 5T squared gives the distance from the ground. D, um, which is measured in meters after T seconds. So we'll plug these values into this equation, right? So you're going to do 32 minus 5 times 0 squared and get 32. 32 minus 5 times 0.5 squared, and you would get 30.75. 32 minus 5 times 1 squared would give us 27, 32 minus five times 1.5 squared gives 20.75, and 32 minus five times two squared gives us 12. And then we'll plot these points. So zero is at 32, and this is counting by fives, five, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, so in between there. Um, 0.5 seconds gives us 30.75. One second gives us 27. 1.5 seconds gives us 20.75. And two seconds gives us 12. B says, is the water bottle falling at a constant speed? Explain how you know. So this is where you're going to look at the distances between these numbers. So when you go 32 or um, 32 minus 30.75 for figuring out how far apart those are, it dropped 1.25. Okay. And then for the next gap, this gap is 3.75. And then this gap is 6.25. 
and then this gap is 8.75. So the gaps each half second are widening. So it's not falling at a, at a constant speed. Whoa. So the gaps, I mean, it's, that's probably not the right word, the distances um, between each part are getting larger and larger. Number nine, the graph shows how much insulin in micrograms is in a patient's body after receiving an injection. Write an equation giving the number of micrograms of insulin M in the patient's body H hours after receiving the injection. So this is an exponential decay function. So when you write exponential decay, remember you need the initial value times the growth factor and then to your variable rate, okay? So in this case, our function is M, our input of time is hours or H. Our initial value here is at 200. And maybe I'll do that a different color so you can see where the number came from. So 200. Then we wanna figure out the growth factor and bring it to our variable, which in this case is H. So your growth factor, you're gonna obtain the growth factor by taking two um, output values and dividing them, consecutive ones. So we wanna take this output value, which is at 80, and divide that by 200. So this is our growth factor. You could put that in there. Um, I'm gonna simplify it. So both of these divide by 10. So then we're left at eight over 20. They both divide by four. So eight divided by four is two and 20 divided by four is five. So that's my growth factor. So that means that there's two fifths of this amount left after each hour in the patient's body. So now it wants to know after three hours, will the patient still have at least 10 micrograms of insulin? So we just wanna plug three into this function. So we wanna look at what M of three equals. So we'll do 200 times two fifth to the third, and this will give us 12.8 micrograms. And so the answer to this is that at least 10, yes. Okay, so yes, they because they have 12.8, which is at least as big as 10, bigger than 10, right? <laughs> 